Thanks for joining me today. I'm Jeff Gertz, and today we're thinking about the staggering thing that God has done. We're coming to you from our new studio. Hope you enjoy it. Well, I doubt that you will have heard of Chuck Feeney, but the truth is that you should have. Charles F. Feeney is a man worthy of your respect. He's a man worthy of counting as one of your heroes. Chuck Feeney is a man that, if it were possible, we'd want to have over for dinner. Here he is. I've got a picture of him. He died late last year at the age of 92. Chuck is a hero of the highest order. He's the kind of man that you want your daughter to marry. He's the kind of man that you, well, that you personally want to know and the kind of man that you want to model yourself after. At one point, Chuck was enormously wealthy. No one knows exactly quite how wealthy, but somewhere around $8 billion worth of wealthy. That is 150 billion rand. At one point, he owned 150,000 million rand dealers. Uh, just to put that in some sort of perspective, Cape Town has a budget of 71 billion this year. Chuck Feeney owned more than double Cape Town's entire annual budget. But in the early 1980s, he decided that having that much money was nonsense. And so he embarked on a journey to spend the rest of his life anonymously giving his fortune away. He lived in a modest rented apartment in San Francisco. And over the course of the next 35 years, he took great lengths to conceal his identity, his wealth and his generosity. And he secretly gave all his money away until in 2020, he gave the last $7 million dollars to Cornell University and signed the documents dissolving all of his foundations. Some of his money even came to South Africa to fund AIDS care. Now, I tell you about Chuck Feeney because his life exemplifies the kind of heroism that is at the heart of our universe. Today, we're thinking about God the hero. We're thinking about God coming downwards so that we might go upwards. We're studying Nehemiah this term. It's an Old Testament post-exilic Bible book, which means the events are happening around about 450 BC. It's the story of a man who builds a wall a long time ago, which at first glance sounds particularly uninspiring, dull, and useless to us. He doesn't build a castle or a pal palace, it's, it's just a wall, and it's not even a very grand wall. But I promise you that this narrative contains truths for us that are profoundly important today, right now, for you as we grapple with the dreadfulness of our world. But, but before we get there, I want to make an initial comment about hermeneutics. I love saying that word, hermeneutics. I love the glaze that comes over your eyes when I say it. Hermeneutics. It's the same power, isn't it, that doctors have. We go and tell them that we've got a pain and they say, well, take an analgesic. And we all go, huh, what's that? And, and then we realize that they just mean take a panada. Well, hermeneutics, is something that you do all the time when you read the Bible. And in fact, when you read anything at all. And you don't even know that you're doing it, but you are. Nor do you give much thought to how you're doing hermeneutics. But do it you do. And so thinking about how you do it, you must. So here is hermeneutics in action. Should we be doing what Nehemiah did? A few weeks ago at our church council meeting, we were discussing the church parking problem and the building of a new garden wall. So should I, as the rector, have begun that meeting with a little reading from Nehemiah and then explain that the Lord wants us, just as Nehemiah did, to build a new wall? Or should we build walls around Jerusalem today? Jerusalem is under great threat politically. So should we advocate for a wall to be built to keep her safe, as did Nehemiah? Or are we to build walls around our lives to keep out the forces of evil that are threatening to overwhelm us? Should we retreat into a wall-encircled doomsday shelter filled with toilet rolls and cans of baked beans? Or are we to read the Bible like Aesop's fables, where, where what we do is we identify the moral of the story and say, yeah, well, we should be doing that. So Nehemiah is a good leader, so we should be a good leader, just like he was. Or Nehemiah prays, so should we pray like Nehemiah did? Or do we just read the Bible based on how we feel? I feel that this is saying this to me today, even if tomorrow I feel something different. How are we to read and understand the Bible? That 
is the question of hermeneutics. Well, here's the most important principle that you must get fixed in your mind. You're going to have to fight to remember this. You're going to have to train yourself to think this way and do this. Ready for it? Here it is. Here's Hermeneutics 101. The Bible's not about you. The Bible's not about me. The Bible's not about us. The Bible's not about South Africa or the Ukraine or Palestine. The Bible is about God. Got it? It's about God. So the story of Nehemiah is recorded in the Bible to teach us about God. To teach us about God's story, who God is, what God is like, what God is doing, how our world fits into God's plans. It's all about God. And as we get to know God, then our lives fit and start to make sense. And we get to, as we get to know God, we start to understand why the world is the way it is. We start to grasp how to live our own lives. But we can't and mustn't start with us as if we're the center of the universe or the center of the Bible because we just aren't. That's the great mistake that humanity always makes. We always think it's about us, but it's not. It's about God. So our questions today as we come to Nehemiah are these. What do we learn about God? And then how does what we know about God affect our lives today? I've got a picture of daffodils. They're pretty spectacular even. Who likes daffodils? Now, I doubt you know this, but daffodils have come to be associated with Narcissus, the hunter in Greek mythology. Narcissus was known for his beauty, which was noticed pretty much by all. But Narcissus rejected the advances of all, eventually falling in love with the reflection he saw in a pool of water. He became entranced in love with it. But he didn't realize that this reflection was in fact himself. He used to gaze longingly into the water. The myth says that he beat himself purple in agony at being kept apart from his reflected love. And for some unknown reason, in his place, sprouted a yellow flower, the daffodil. Narcissus gives, us, gives rise to our word narcissist, some, someone that's in love with themselves. Well, don't fall in love with the reflections of yourself that you see in the deep streams of the scriptures. Long instead to see God there. Hermeneutics 101, here it is. Let's say it together. It's all about God. So what do we learn about God? Well, remember that last week, Nehemiah chapter 1 ends with this comment. Now I was cupbearer to the king. Which is just to say that Nehemiah was an esteemed official in the court of Artaxerxes. A cupbearer was a high-ranking royal official, primarily in charge of serving wine to the king. Let's read. What happens? Nehemiah chapter 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid, and I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, then you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for, for the good hand of my God was upon him. At first glance, it doesn't seem like a particularly interesting story. Nehemiah the cupbearer asked the king if he, go, if he can go and rebuild Jerusalem. But let's pause for a moment and carefully consider what's actually happening here. This is like, Deputy President Paul Mashatile saying to the president, 
I'd like to resign from my high position and go to South Sudan to work as an unpaid community worker. Or it's like Chuck Feeney giving away $8 billion. It's a strange act. It would be a notable act if it was done today. A high-ranking government official steps aside from their comforts and privileges to enter into a world of brokenness so as to aid people that are suffering, downtrodden, and without hope, at deep personal cost to themselves. But actually, you know, it's even bigger than that. This is Paul Mashatile offering to step aside as deputy president in order to work for the rebuilding of Urania. You see, the city that lies in ruins is a, well, it's a problem city to their conquerors. They're a rebellious people. Jerusalem has a history of rebellion and dissent. No wonder that as Nehemiah speaks to Artaxerxes, he's terrified and he prays. This is the day when if you displease the king, well, your head came off. And Nehemiah was asking the king to risk his own life because now he'd need a new cupbearer. And so he prays. It's something we're already noticing quite often about Nehemiah. He's a man whose life is soaked in prayer. But he's praying extra hard because his request is actually quite dangerous. In chapter 1, we saw Nehemiah praise and fast for, well, for four months. So should we be like Nehemiah in our prayers? Well, of course we should. Should we pray like him? Yes, of course we should. But remember Hermeneutics 101. This is not about us. The story is not about us. No, instead we're being taught about God. We're being shown here a picture of someone who empties himself of his privilege, someone who empties himself of his glory, someone who empties himself of his wealth, someone who willingly descends into the darkness and the pain and the despair to bring about a cosmic solution. And by now you should be thinking that this sounds like Jesus. What Nehemiah does is what God will do on a cosmic scale for the world. Nehemiah left the palace and the privilege and the safety and the steam and he went into a world of woe, a world where God's people were in desperate need. He left privilege for backbreaking hardship and labor. And if he hadn't done it, God's people would have been lost. He went on a mission of mercy. And so too on an infinitely grander scale to Jesus. He left the heavenly palace. He left the right-hand side of God. He left his eternal glory as the infinite son of God to come as a blue-collar worker in this mess. He came for us, not just at the risk of death, but with the certainty of it. God's son came downwards so that we might go upwards. Nehemiah is a challenge to worship, a reminder of the staggering, overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God for his world, for us, for you. God came down for us. Let's meditate on that. Let's remember that. In all the mess of the world, know this. God left heaven to come down for you. That's the stuff of adoration and worship. It's praise Jesus. Speak of him. Value him. Revel in him. Love him. Let's never forget the depths of the love of God for us. Let's let the truth of Jesus' incarnation define our thinking and our living. The Apostle Paul calls us to to let this thinking define us too. He calls us to become like God. Here is Philippians 2 verse 6. It's it's just the most precious pot of gold. It says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. God's journey downwards places a call on our lives in a small, faltering, uncertain way because we are in love with this God. We too embrace the journey downwards for ourselves. When you understand that Jesus came down for you, then you'll go down for others. You'll have to work out what that'll mean for you in your context. Rick Warren in his says this, He says, God created, saved, called, and commanded us to live a life of service. In fact, we're only fully alive when we're helping others. Jesus said, if you insist on saving your life, you'll lose it. If we're not serving, well, we're just existing. Because life is meant for ministry. What many believers need today is to be involved in serving experiences, where they can exercise their spiritual muscles. 
Serving is the opposite of our natural inclination. We say, I'm looking for a church that meets my needs and blesses me. Not, I'm looking for a place to serve and be a blessing. We expect others to serve us, not vice versa. But as we mature in Christ, the focus of our lives increasingly shifts to not getting what we want, but instead to living a life in service of others and taking joy in that. Well, perhaps this will mean getting up out of your chair and crossing the staff room to be friendly to the new teacher who's just arrived. Perhaps it will mean the significant cost of sacrificially loving a drug addict, of you listening to their lies and, and not believing them, but remaining firmly committed in relationship to that particular person. Perhaps this will mean tolerating music in a church that you don't like because you're serving others downwards for their upwards. That's the God we worship. <laughs> People are always looking for interesting things to, to tattoo on their bi biceps. How about this? Sum tertius. That's a Latin phrase. All you got, got to be in Latin. It means I am third. God first, other second, you third. It's the essence of what Jesus has done. Now, before you sign up, make sure you read the whole chapter. Nehemiah asks the king if he can go. The king gives permission. Surely now it'll all be smooth sailing. Here's Nehemiah 2, verse 9. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now, the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. Then, jump your eyes down to chapter 2, verse 19. But when Sambalat the Horonite, and Tobiah the Ammonite servant, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us, and despised us, and said, What is this thing that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion or claim or right in Jerusalem. Nehemiah, he arrives in Jerusalem. And no sooner does he pitch up to serve them, than the critics start and the opposition rises. The way of God, the work of God, the life of God, the mission of God is always opposed. The prosperity preacher on the God channel says, if you live for Jesus, all your problems will disappear. It's a wicked lie. If you live for God, you'll be opposed and persecuted. Nehemiah is opposed. The prophets are opposed. Jesus is opposed. The apostles were opposed. The church has always been scorned and mocked and even killed. For saying just this, there is a God. He emptied himself. He came to die for you. And I'd like to die for you too. It seems madness to us that the world might think to oppose that. But they do. And we'll be opposed too. And the year of mission and mercy will always be a year of opposition and criticism. But so be it. We serve a great God and Jesus is just too important not to share. So let's get on with the good works that we have been given to do. Nehemiah 2 verse 11 says, So I went to Jerusalem and was there for three days. Then I arose in the night and I and a few men with me and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Verse 14, then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate. And so returned. And the officials did not know where I'd gone or, or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of God, the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. 
So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Now, you're starting to understand why I started with the story of Chuck Feeney. Chuck emptied himself so that others might be raised up. I know a man like Chuck. Actually, I know quite a few. Some are even in our church congregation and community. The one particular man that I'm thinking of right now ran a very successful business, which he listed on the stock exchange, and he then proceeded to give his substantial shareholding away. It's truly quite special to know people like this. It still gives me goosebumps. But you know, we have something better. We know the God who came downwards for us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you've seen the ruin, you've seen the misery. You've seen that this world is destroyed. And so you have sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to rebuild all that we have broken. Your good hand was upon him. Staggeringly, your rebuilding work will be opposed and despised and rejected. But you will make it prosper. We pray may we live in the sure knowledge of your incarnation and trusting its outcome. Keeping our eyes ever fixed on you, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.